Welcome here, everyone. Please stand with us. Let's start with some singing. Come, let us worship our King. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great Sing it out. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. Redancing your freedom, awaken the life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great Been faithful, you've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For oh, your promises, yes, and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great. 
unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Conquer the grave, you free every captive, break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awaken the light, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, you have done great Amen. Right? Amen. Welcome here. Welcome to South Abbotsford Church. Thank you so much for being here. We're so glad you're here. Um, yeah, an amazing morning. After what I felt was an amazing weekend, last weekend, um, just with uh, Easter weekend. And I don't know if you were at the services, um, the Good Friday service, just, um, just a time to kind of position ourselves before Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, before Jesus, and, um, and just focus on the weekend. And then Sunday morning, just an, an amazing celebration. I don't have any water bottle up here that I'm going to kick around or anything, so. Um, but I just, I felt like it was such, um, such an amazing time, you know, the, the whole weekend, even the Saturday in between was the time that I was able to kind of re recenter, refocus on, um, on, on why we're here, on, on what we do here, and on, on just the specialness and the, and the, um, the gratitude I have for, for Jesus' sacrifice for me, um, and, and how that all came together last weekend with Easter. And so, looking ahead now, right, this weekend, we are in that time of waiting, right? Which is actually our time in history, right? We're in between the first and the second coming of Jesus, right? And so we are in that time now. And so, yes, it's the weekend after, after Easter, but it is, it is this time that we are living in. And so what are we doing to prepare ourselves for that second coming, right? How are we, how are we living our lives? How are we focused on Jesus? Now we've recentered, we've refocused, based on last weekend, right? Now, where are we going? What are we doing? What are we doing to prepare ourselves? How are we preparing ourselves in, in how we treat others? And, and just, um, you know, thinking, how are we going to react when he comes back? What are we going to sing? And so this next song, it's called Hosanna, right? And, and we are going to sing that again when we see him again, right? His, his second coming, we're going to see him coming on the clouds, and we're going to sing Hosanna. And so sing with us, with that in mind, just this time of, of waiting, this time of, of hope and expectation of Jesus coming.
You came down. You came down from heaven's throne. This earth you formed was not your home. A love like this, the world had never known. A crown of thorns to mock your Let there be no higher name, Jesus, Son of God. You laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son of God. took our sin, right? Because he took our sin, you bore our shame, you rose to life, you defeated the grave. A love like this, the world has never known. On the altar let there be no higher name, Jesus, Son of God. You laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son of God. Be lifted high. Be lifted high. was enough be lifted higher than all you've overcome your name be louder than any other song there is no power that can come against your love the cross was enough the cross was enough of our praise let there be no higher name Jesus Son of God you laid down your perfect life you are the sacrifice Jesus Son of God sing that again on the altar of our praise let there be no higher No power that 
cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. Is the cross enough? Amen. Lord, we thank you at the amazing sacrifice and the amazing redemption that you give our lives because of Jesus. We are in honor and humbled and glorify your name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome everyone uh, in the sanctuary, uh, also online. I'm Garth Borthesel. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at South Abbotsford Church. And it's, uh, it's really good to be here, just to be together in the name of the Lord. Um, we have a lot of great things uh, in store this uh, Sunday. And uh, so just a couple little housekeeping things. We do love connecting. And I was uh, thinking about this. Uh, we always talk about connecting with the church, which is very true. We can, the, the welcome desk, the QR code, we get forms every week uh, with things and we love following up. But connecting is also what you do. And so I'm gonna encourage you if, even briefly after the service, connect with someone you, if you haven't talked to in a long time or you don't know or you're sitting beside, ask a few questions and just connect. Connecting is not just the form, it's all of us together, amen? Um, and then the other thing we do is giving and uh, it's part of our obedience, it's part of our following Jesus, it's part of our how we uh, approach our dollars and our sacrifice and so we always, want to be able to um, give opportunity for that. We have many different options and ways to do that. So I just wanna pray for all of that right now. So join me in prayer. Lord, thank you that you give us more than we could ever understand and that we can ever under, and, and grasp and that uh, we wanna live our lives in every area following you. So we dedicate our giving and this time and the resources that we have in time and dollars and wisdom uh, to you in Jesus name. Amen. Um, we're going to do church news in a, in, in a few minutes here, but there's going to be an error in it. So I'll tell you what the error is right now. But it wasn't, it wasn't Jeff's fault. I'm not blaming him at all. Um, <laughs> There's going to be a thing that says the senior study starts again this coming Wednesday, but that's not true. It's going to be delayed one week. There's a memorial service here on the same day on Wednesday, so it gets a little complicated. So you'll see on the screen senior study, um, Ed Balzer's going to lead it, uh, but it starts the following week, not this week, okay? And uh, I think that's it. So why don't we bring the kids up? Come on, kids down. And teachers. <clears throat> so we love the kids. We love seeing this. But I want to I want to thank the teachers, the people that spend their time preparing, praying for these kids, teaching these kids, getting to know them and uh, servicing in that way. Let's give a hand to all the teachers that do this every week. Yeah. Okay, so let's pray for it. Lord, thank you for the teachers. Thank you for their heart. Thank you for that they see into the future through these kids. And they see uh, the name of Jesus being proclaimed for generations to come. Bless this time today. May you anoint each classroom, each session, each group activity, and may it glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. And with that, church news with the error.
Medium turkey chili. <laughs> Medium crab bisque. I didn't get any bread. Just forget it, let it go. Um, excuse me, I, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars, but everyone in front of me got free bread. No soup for you! Well, good morning, church. I promise you there will be both soup and buns, okay, at that fundraiser. It's our delight many times throughout the year to just talk about being on mission together. I'm going to call up Alex Suderman, Alex and Carla, very much part of our church family with their four children, uh, are in Dortmund, Germany, church planting. And Alex is here for the weekend. Welcome, man, and uh, just give us uh, some of the story and the update on, uh, on what God's called you to do there. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here, and uh, it's been five years since uh, our family spent some time here in, uh, in South Abbotsford Church. I don't know if you have my PowerPoint with a picture of our, our family up there. Um, we have four children, and we are here for our focus training, and in that time, we were so impacted by you as a church and uh, the, the youth ministry here. Two of our kids were actually baptized while we were here, and then you came alongside us and partnered with us so that we could launch into our ministry in, in Germany as well. And it's so, so great to be here and love to see, yeah, the clip with that, uh, that clip from Seinfeld, although I don't think that would fly in Germany. I don't think I would use that there. <laughs> it would, uh, yeah, probably, yeah, you know. <laughs> If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, a lot, in a lot of ways, when Carl and I and our family were launched into Germany, we felt like the servants in the story of Jesus turning water into wine. You know the story in John chapter 2. Uh, Jesus, there, there's this impending crisis that they're going to run out of wine at this party, a wedding feast. And uh, at the request of his mother, Jesus responds to this impending crisis and says to the servants, fill up the jars with water and take them to the master of the ceremonies. And I often wonder what those servants felt like when they were asked by Jesus to do this. You know, when did they experience the miracle? Was it when, you know, they were taking it out? Did the water transform into wine? When, when they took it, uh, you know, when people drank it and, you know, as they drank it, it transformed? We don't know the answer to that question. But I could imagine the servants being, you know, following Jesus under his direction to do this, but also not quite knowing what to expect, what's going to happen here. And we felt like that as well. Under the direction of Jesus, the call of God to go to a new uh, city, the city of Dortmund in, in Germany, it's in the west part of, northwest part of Germany, not quite knowing what to expect. And that's the reality for like a, a mission life. You have faith, you have hope, you have support and that type of thing. You might have a strategy in, that you want to implement, but in reality, you have no clue. You go in faith and you trust God for the miracle. And we are invited to the city of Dortmund um, by Multiply uh, director in Europe, Johan Matties. They had been praying for the city for a long time. And it's kind of in a strategic location, an area that they wanted to see a church planted. It's a city of 600,000 people. Perhaps you know it from soccer. It's the most known city in Germany and in Europe for, for soccer, the Bayfell Bay. They actually call their stadium the temple. It's so sacred, this place. And it is an amazing experience to go to a soccer game there. It's 80,000 people, 85,000 people, and it's, it's quite amazing. But it's also a city that's in need of hope. A lot of people there are, um, are, are living in kind of a sense of hopelessness. The city has been in an economic transformation in the last decades, uh, so it's probably one of the most financially depressed cities in Germany. And what I, I've observed in the last five years is just people having, having kind of a hole in their heart and looking for something to fill that in. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. For example, this, this woman in the, the picture, Marla, uh, we baptized her last year, and um, she, in her testimony, it was amazing how, how she just shared how she came to know Jesus. She had been baptized as an infant in the state church, but as many Germans are, just kind of 
uh, nominal Christians. They would maybe go to church at Christmas or something like that. And she, in her testimony, she shared how for, there was always something missing. She talked about this laka, this gap in her heart. And she comes from a great family. Her father's a doctor. They have a practice in, in the city. Uh, you know, they, they're doing well. But she said there was always something missing. And she would seek for affirmation to do good well, do well in her, her schooling with grades to get affirmation from her parents or maybe a, attention from boys or whatever it might be. And it wasn't until she met Jesus that that hole in her heart was filled. And, uh, and she met Jesus and has a living faith in Christ. And she hears God's voice. She hears the voice of the shepherd now on a daily basis. She's being discipled and she's walking with Jesus. And we're so grateful because she's also the girlfriend of my son. <laughs> so we're really happy about that as well. And we're, our question is, I know there are more people like her in our city and God's been gracious. We have seen the miracle. You know, we have had a taste of the transforming of water into wine. Uh, we started a church in our, our apartment as a team. And, and then uh, after that, as, as we were growing, we now have a building that we're renting. And we are around 60 to 70 people meeting on a, on a Sunday. And uh, it's a really wonderful community, and we're, we now have um, some of my teammates who are Germans, they're now pastors there, and now we're starting to dream about multiplication, what does that look like? But yeah, to taste and see that, that th this water into wine, this transformation, we're hungry for that. We want to see more of that. Who are the, the next Marlas that want to come to Jesus? And I know that people are seeking, even if a month ago I was preaching, and normally every Sunday, we give an opportunity for people to respond to the gospel, to Jesus. And for some reason, this Sunday, I didn't. And uh, after the service, a woman with a, a Muslim background came to us, and she was saying, I was actually waiting for the opportunity to give my life to Jesus. Could I pray with someone? <laughs> and so it was a good reminder for me, like, let's not neglect and fail to actually call people and invite people to follow Jesus, because they might just respond and say yes. If you could go to the next slide, please. Now we're in a kind of a transition now. Uh, in our, our, we've been there five years, and yeah, as I said, we're, we're dreaming about what, what does it look like to equip our church? Uh, what does the multiplication look like? And we have a ministry to, in our neighborhood with soccer. We have a ministry to children. In the last year, I felt inspired to initiate a new ministry that I'm calling the Pickaxe Project and wanting to leverage some of the gifts and talents that I have in order to make connections with people, to, to create dialogue about the gospel, and to share Jesus and invite them into community. And I've been sitting on this image of the pickaxe for like five years. And really the, the idea is, the tagline is, breaking ground for new life. And my question is, how do we creatively engage in our culture um, for gospel renewal, but using, but using the arts, using music, using uh, visual arts, or whatever it might be. And uh, you could, this is, our, our logo is also a QR code, so I just, the, the website for it went live last week. You can take a picture of that and see that if you want. And so what are the, some of the things we're doing? For example, last uh, February, um, I've put a band together, we call it the Pickaxe Collective, and we're playing in clubs in Dortmund. And we also, um, I've, I've written nine songs that I'm calling and putting into a, an album called Hymns of New Wine. And we performed this at a club and we did a recording of it and we're going to have a release party in June. And uh, also next month I'm going to be doing a lecture uh, with students from the University of Dortmund. And uh, kind of using some of my doctoral work, I did a dissertation on Nietzsche. And my, my lecture title is Morality after the death of God, engaging faith and identity, or engaging Nietzsche on faith and identity in a secular age. And then in June, we want to have a release party and uh, invite as many friends as possible to this where we can play some of the music and then share gospel through it. And that's just the first phase of this project. We just want to kind of get through this one and we have ideas for further projects, but um, we're doing it one step at a time. If you could go to the next slide, please. So I'm here to remind you that uh, I exist. Um, I am your missionary. One of your, Carl and I are your missionaries here. 
And we are setting ourselves up for the next five years of, of ministry. We want to see this project through. We want to see church multiplication. And we are seeking for support and partners to take us forward. We're, we're very, very thankful for the generous support that you give us as a church. We are very grateful for that. If there are peer, if you have a calling or a sense of, um, that you might want to partner with us individually, please talk to me after the service. I'm also raising funds for this pickaxe project, for the production costs, for the music, and that type of thing, if you want to give a one-time donation. And if you want to learn more, the last slide, please. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry and this project and, and what God has called us to, um, of course, we can chat after the service a bit, but I'm also hosting an event at Eric and Jamie Taves' this evening at 7 o'clock. And provided the weather goes well, we will um, have a bonfire, we will sing Kumbaya, I will, I will play a, a, some of the music, and uh, there'll be cheese and crackers and a, a, a br beverages appropriate to the first miracle of Jesus. And... Um, <laughs> sharing stories more about what God is doing and just really have a good time. So if you want to learn more about that, please come, please talk to me afterward. Thank you. <laughs> just stay okay. All right, well, extend your hand and let's just thank God for what he's done in the first five years and what he's, what he's planning yeah. in the next five. Alex. Uh, we, uh, as a church, love being a part of your team. Thanks. So it's easy for us to just ask God for more. Yeah. So, Father, we are in agreement. Thank you for the amazing way that you've established a, a gospel witness in Dortmund uh, through Alex and Carla's call and response to that call and gathering a team and, and being faithful to proclaim the gospel, to love people. And now there's a body, a church, and they're thinking about multiplying that to another. And uh, Lord, we just, uh, we pray for the timing and the people and the team around that. We pray, continue to pray, Lord, for th this creative new uh, outlet of just engaging in, in kind of the public square and in, in the conversation with people in Dortmund. And just pray, Father, that this will bear much fruit. We pray for Carla and the kids who are back there and school and all the things that are going on, but may they continue to experience your favor, your blessing, your fulfillment in all aspects of their lives. So we commit uh, this family to you. In Christ's name, we agree. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. I don't know if you saw the uh, Columbia Bible College table as you came in, but uh, we are Blessed to uh, have Steve Brown here to um, uh, share the word this morning in it. But let's talk about uh, CBC. So first of all, I'm not an original Abbotsford. So when the first year everybody talked about CBC, I thought, man, the TV station's very active in <laughs> Abbotsford. But I was wrong. <laughs> so how many here um, are a student, have been a student, a graduate, faculty, uh, or your kids went to CBC, just sort of stand up for a minute. And uh, let's just see the, oh. That's very significant. If you're watching online, there's like, I don't know, a quarter of the population of that. So isn't that cool? The Columbia Bible College is uh, intertwined very deeply here. So, um, Steve Brown is, uh, Dr. Steve Brown is the new president. He started February 1. He was uh, inducted in that role yesterday here at this, at this very room, in this very place here. And uh, I don't know if you know him, he's an author, he's a speaker, um, very deep into leadership, uh, Arrow Leadership, he led that for many different years. His book is gonna be available, Jesus Centered. He'll be talking about that um, at the back table um, as well. But uh, uh, we also have uh, a group of students uh, who are in the Quest program, which is one of the programs. It's a one-year program led by uh, Jeremy Walker, wherever you are. Um, he's the leader of all that. And uh, so we're gonna have Steve come on up, and uh, Kenzie, and Emma, and Micah come on up as well. And uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about this trip. This is Steve, just so he's not a student. Yeah. And uh, 
This is uh, Kenzie and Emma and Micah here. And they're about to launch onto one of the trips. And uh, then we're going to have Steve pray for them. And uh, then we'll go from there. So Kenzie, start us off. Where are you going and why are you going? Yeah, so we're going to um, Kigali, Rwanda. And we're going to be partnering with this organization called Kurumbuka. They, um, as it says up on the screen there, they work to um, train and empower young leaders in Africa and ultimately just prepare them to be a light and to be Jesus' hands and feet to um, the people around them. And so our purpose of going and working with them is going to just be um, to be available to whatever they have for us to do. Um, and so we're going to be spending the majority of our time um, building a low ropes course to help them with their leadership program. Um, and then we're also going to be doing other things like going to visit um, a genocide museum and going on a safari and just experiencing um, the different culture that they have there. Um, and yeah, we're really just excited to be in community with them, to share experiences, and to just experience um, a different way of worshiping God. Yeah, what I like about this trip, it's, it's focused on their leadership, so developing local leaders for local solutions. And this team is going to be pressing into that. So I think that's a super cool aspect. Micah, what gets you excited about this trip? Man, I mean, like, story has been such, like, an integral part of Quest so far. And I mean, going to Rwanda, like, there's just going to be amazing stories there. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really excited for that. I mean, you can't say Rwanda without thinking of its tragedy. Right. Yeah, I mean, best part about Rwanda is that it's no longer defined by that tragedy. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I mean, like... That's the culture that I want to be immersed in. That's the culture that we want to be immersed in there. Um, hearing those, those, the miraculous redemption story for Rwanda. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. That's, that's very well said. Redemption um, is a beautiful thing to do all that. Absolutely. Okay, Emma, yeah. what kind of makes you nervous about this trip? Like, what's, what's the realities of this for you guys? I am nervous for the unknown aspect that comes with trips like these. Um, there's like we can try our best to like plan things but ultimately it is like we're partnering with Karambuka and we are following what they would like us to do right um so for prayer we would love um yeah just prayer that we could connect um god into just wherever we are and whatever we're doing in the moment and that we'd be fully immersed in the experience that we're having and yeah prayer for the, we have a lot of other things coming up before we go on yeah, this trip, sure. um, between graduation and finals and things like that. So we just would love prayer that we could finish off the year well, and then as well find rest before we go on this trip. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah. Did they cover it well, Kenzie? Did they do a good job? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, why don't, why, don't, why don't we pray for them? Why don't that's, you lead us in prayer? Sounds great. Time. If you're able, why don't you stand with me, if you could? Our first song was, God, you've done great things. And it's a reminder in Germany, God's done great things, is doing great things, and will do great things. In the lives of these young adults, God has done great things, God is doing great things, and God will do great things. And it's a celebration, in a sense, for your church, because to disciple young people takes a church. So this is a celebration for you as well as a commissioning. So let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you are doing great things in Germany, at South Abbotsford Church, in Rwanda, and in the lives of these young adults. Lord, we pray uh, that they would, as they go on this mission, Lord, that they would learn from saints and servants in Rwanda. Lord, that they would uh, bless those in Rwanda as they serve together as a team. We pray for your protection, your provision over them, and Lord, we look forward to hearing how you will work in and through them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, good morning, South Abbotsford Church. This is my second morning here in a row. So yesterday I was here and uh, was celebrating a new chapter in God's faithful story at Columbia Bible College. As we turn a new chapter, uh, me leading as a new president, I'm also very sensitive that this is a new chapter for South Abbotsford Church as well. And uh, so thankful to Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Garth for inviting me here. And to recognize not only by the number of people who stood up, 
that there's this beautiful convergence between South Abbotsford Church and Columbia Bible College. And I wanted to share with you a couple pictures I shared yesterday. Uh, let's see if we can put it up there. This is South Abbotsford Church way back, circa about 1930 something. So that's the, uh, the original, or one of the original church buildings in the background. And in the foreground, that building in the foreground is something called South Abbotsford Mennonite Bible School, which was really the forerunner and the start of what 90 years later would become Columbia Bible College. So fun. South Abbotsford Mennonite Brethren Bible College. Hard to get that on a sweatshirt, <laughs> but amazing to think of. God's faithfulness over the years. God has done great things. Let's look at the next picture. I don't know if there's any relatives up there, but these are the early students and early leaders of South Abbotsford Mennonite Brethren Bible School. And I, if, if those pictures could speak, what would they say, I wonder? What would those pictures say? I think some of the things that those pictures would say would be God has done great things. I think some of those people would say, all those people would say, God has done more than we could have asked or imagined. As we look at this group here today, as we look down the street to what God's doing at Columbia Bible College, I think they say, God has done more than we could ask or imagine. And I think they'd also might say, South Abbotsford Church continue to be kingdom seekers, not empire builders. Because this church has a legacy, a history, a foundation of being kingdom seekers. How can we bless this community? How can we partner with what God wants to do outside these walls in this community and around the world? I think God also says through these voices, if they could speak, lean in. Lean into this next chapter at South Abbotsford with anticipation of what God's going to do. Any amens in the crowd? Yeah. It's good to be here. We have a number of our team who are part of your congregation, and I am just uh, love working with them. And uh, thank you for praying for them. They are on the front lines of walking alongside the next generation and pointing them to Jesus and equipping them to serve in Jesus' name around the world. Uh, one quick commercial. If you are... A commercial had to come. If you are a young adult, if you're trying to figure out what's next, it is a huge, complicated question with lots of possibilities and permutations. If you're trying to figure out what's next, I'd encourage you to stop by the table with Robin in the foyer and just see, is, is Columbia something, a place where I could lean into my faith and seek to launch my life in a way that would glorify God? Uh, that year, that two years, that four years, would be a great investment in my mind, but I am biased, so. End of commercial. In a, next weekend, I think you're starting a, a series in Colossians. And the series in Colossians, I'm gonna preview just a little bit, one little segment of that series from Colossians chapter one. Let's put it up on the screen. See if you can catch the main person, main point of this passage, all right? Look for the bold letters. Uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus is the head of the body of the church. Jesus is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, Jesus might have the supremacy. It keeps going. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Jesus' blood shed on a cross. I don't know how many times Jesus came up there, but a lot. You don't have to you know, have a degree from a Bible college to go, Jesus is a big deal. And if you are here last weekend, you're reminded that Jesus is the biggest deal. A cross, an empty tomb. Jesus is a big deal, the biggest deal. And even though we can know that, sometimes Jesus being at the center of our lives is something that 
isn't really happening. Jesus becomes a, a checkbox. And maybe we've heard the message so many times it becomes old news rather than good news. I remember a few years ago, I'm in full-time vocational ministry. I'm at a Good Friday service. We were doing a community service at Gateway Church. And I'm there on Good Friday morning. And I didn't have the cross on my mind. What I had on my mind that morning was soil. We just had a delivery of soil delivered to our driveway on Thursday. And if you know the spring in Abbotsford, it rains all the time. And I am looking at the first sunny day in months. And I got soil on my mind before my driveway becomes this mud bowl the next day. So I'm doing something on that Good Friday service that maybe some of you have even done today. It's really subtle. What I was doing without trying to let my family see was I started doing, I I started with this. You just kind of get your watch kind of somewhere where you can look at it, and then you do this. Nobody noticed, right? Because I was trying to think about how long is this gonna take? A Good Friday service with me with the attitude of how long is this going to take because I got soil back home. And what happened in that service was a convicting time for me because toward the uh, very kind of moment before the service started, this kind of ragtag group of uh, young guys came uh, up and into the service and they sat in the front row and my kind of first thing is like, guys, you don't sit in the front row unless you're a pastor's family or a pastor or something, you sit somewhere else. And then as soon as the music started in this somber service on Good Friday, these guys are like, and I'm like this. And these guys are like that. And through the service, I'm going, what's with these guys? How come they're singing so loud? It's supposed to be a somber service. We got through the service. And I watched in the parking lot as these guys that came late were a bit louder than they should have been, had hands going all up. I watched as they jumped on board their Teen Challenge vans. And it hit me. Teen Challenge is an addiction recovery ministry and program. It hit me that these guys were desperate for Jesus. And Jesus was at the center of their lives, even though their lives had a lot of mess in it. And I was like, why am I doing this? I want to share with you three pictures. Three pictures that I pray would remind you about Jesus. That would maybe reset Jesus at the center of your lives. And maybe would give you spark to share about Jesus outside these walls. So, let's look at the first picture this first picture. How many of you have been to Israel and you've seen this picture in person? It's called the encounter. And the encounter, this this picture actually fills a a wall. It's a huge mural. And it comes from Mark chapter 5. Let me read a little bit of Mark chapter 5 to you. Jesus is on a mission to help uh, a little girl who's dying, but he's interrupted as he was so many times because a woman was there who'd been bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting well, she became even more worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And I don't know if you've ever read that passage and thought about feet, but this picture has all these feet, and I'd never imagined this woman being down on her, maybe hands and knees, crawling through the crowd. And why would she be doing that? Well, there's actually a good reason or two why the artist might have thought she was doing that. Because one, she was a woman. You don't just walk up to a rabbi. Two, she's an unclean woman, would make the whole community unclean if she was around them. So maybe getting down on her hands and feet and squirreling her way through the crowd was her only way to get to Jesus. She's desperate for him. 
even though she might have these what I call nobody lies. The nobody lies are these. Nobody sees me, nobody cares about me, nobody understands me, and nobody can help me. Have you ever, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but has that ever come through your mind? Nobody sees me, nobody understands me, nobody can help me, nobody cares. Those are all probably stirring inside her, yet she's desperate for Jesus. And what happens next in Mark chapter five? Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. A miracle. 12 years, all her money, all those doctors and Jesus. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said, there's so many people here, how can you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter. Not woman, not unclean woman, not newly healed woman, but this word and term of intimacy, he says, daughter. And then he turns the miracle back on her. He says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I love this picture. It reminds us, it asks us, are we desperate for Jesus? Or are we good? I'm good, thanks. I'm comfortable, thanks. This woman's desperate for Jesus. And she knows that Jesus sees her, cares about her, understands her, and can help her. She leaves with that truth confirmed in her life. Question for you. Maybe, maybe this is audience participation time. I would love for you to do this. Would you turn to a neighbor, just very briefly here, and say, Jesus sees you, to your neighbor. Would you do that? Just say that, Jesus sees you. It's okay, it's a bit corny, but you can do it. That wasn't so hard. And I suspect most of us here believe that. Jesus does see the person beside me. But it becomes a lot more personal and a lot more difficult if I were to ask you to say out loud, Jesus sees me. I can believe that Jesus sees you, but does Jesus see me? Do you ever wonder that? I'm in the desert in Phoenix. Uh, There's lots of desert, not a lot of water. And I spent a day, I've been reflecting, spending quiet time with Jesus. And it came time for me to uh, head to the airport uh, where I was having a meeting. So I got Uber uh, coming to get me, uh, this guy named Darren. And Darren shows up in the Uber car and I get in the back and there's Christian music just pumping in the back, which is rare for Uber. And so I go, Darren, you a man of faith? And he goes, yeah, I am, are you? And I go, yeah, I am. And then he goes, any chance you're a pastor? And I go, yeah, kind of am. And he goes, no way. He goes, I've been driving around all day wondering if God sees me. And then you show up in the back. And he goes, I've been driving around asking if God sees me because my life's a mess. I'm trying to follow him. And it's like I take two steps forward and three steps back. My wife's in counseling right this minute as we drive in this car because our marriage is on the rocks and he just went on and then he goes, Steve, would you pray for me when we stop at your hotel? And I'm like, this is like the setup of the pastoral prayer of all time. (laughs) I'm like, I'm like thinking about Hagar in Genesis and like the God who sees me. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, David in, in Psalm 139, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God sees you. I'm thinking about Zacchaeus up in the tree and Luke and like, I'm ready to go when we park the car. And I just wind up because this is like made to order. God, thank you that you see Darren, that you see him that you care about him, that you understand him, and that you can help him. And I just kind of went through Hagar and all the rest, and I got to amen. 
And it was like so good, because I mean, God and Uber and like, this is a miracle, right? <laughs> and then Darren goes, could I pray for you before you go? And he prayed for me, we fist bumped, I went into the hotel, was waiting in the hotel, and I sensed, kind of as I was waiting in line, this tap, tap, tap. And the tap, 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 I think was the Holy Spirit. Saying, Steve, what were you doing when you were in the desert just before Darren picked you up? And I, well, I was writing in my journal. And then I sensed another question came, what did you write in your journal? And I actually fumbled into my bag, got my journal out, and my journal reading was this that I wrote in it. God, I feel tired, I feel lonely. Would you in some way reveal yourself to me today? And what just happened there, if you're checking this out, I think God did a two for one miracle. (laughs) Because I'm in the car for Darren, and then when Darren says, Steve, could I pray for you? God was answering my prayer. God, would you reveal yourself to me in some way today? I want to remind you, God sees you. He cares about you. He understands you, and he can help you. Amen? Second picture. Second picture here. This is a picture of the Last Supper, but it's a different one than maybe you're used to. I don't know if you thought about this uh, in the same way last Friday or Thursday night. This is a... Tintoretto, an Italian artist, and there's a lot going on in this picture. Most pictures of the Last Supper look like a soccer team picture. Jesus is the captain in the middle, and then he's got six guys on either side, and they're all looking at the camera. This has like a lot of people in it. They're kind of all dispersed. Um, There's like an angelic thing happening up in that corner, a Holy Spirit thing happening up in this corner. There are women in the picture, and... If you look carefully, there's a cat in the picture. (laughs) Right up front. And I mean, that part at least is heresy, right? Because does Jesus like cats? (laughs) I mean, if this was on track, there'd be a dog there. (laughs) My question that I was asked as I looked at this picture was this. Steve, if you were in this picture, where would you be? Would you be right up close next to Jesus, hanging on his every word? Would you be at a back wall, just kind of, what's going on here, taking it all in from a safe distance? Where would you be if you were in this picture? And my answer, though I was serving in full-time vocational ministry, was, I'm not even in this picture. Where am I, you ask? I'm outside getting stuff ready for Jesus to do next. Sometimes, even in the best-intentioned Christian life, we can get so focused on doing things for Jesus that we actually miss being with Jesus. And if you're doing stuff for Jesus, that means Jesus is somewhere else. He's either watching, you're trying to impress him in some way, but you're not with Jesus. Jesus. He's not at the center of everything in your life. And for me, that was a convicting moment for me to remember that there's no way I can earn my way with Jesus through all my doing stuff for Jesus. It's way better. And it's the intention that we do, we do life with Jesus. 24-7, 365, Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We are with Jesus. That's the story of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus' last words, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That means Thursday at 2.30. Jesus is with you. Amen? Amen. What are the rhythms? You need to remind yourself of that. Rhythms and practices that will help remind you that Jesus is with you. That could be your morning time with Jesus. And I'll give you three kind of checkmark boxes here. If you want to have a consistent time with Jesus every day, you need to have a plan, a place, and a time. If you can't check all three of those boxes, you're going to have great difficulty establishing that rhythm. A place, a plan, and a time. What could that look like for you? What does it look like for you?
It could be midway through the day, you actually have an alarm that actually says, if it goes off and reminds you to stop and pause and pray. Maybe that's your grace at lunchtime, saying, God, I am thankful for from this morning, and I need your grace for fill in the blank for this afternoon. These rhythms are reminding us that God is with us, with us that Jesus is with us. Maybe it's the Sabbath, pausing to remember. It's not all I'm doing for, it's actually enjoying being with. That's what this day is about. Worship, rest, and delight are three great kind of indicators of Sabbath. Well, one more picture from John chapter 10 comes this gate. And this gate, uh, the painting is in my office. If you come by my office, I will tell you the story again. But this painting was painted by a mentor of mine named Leighton Ford. I don't know if you know that name, Leighton Ford. Um, evangelist for decades, uh, brother-in-law to Billy Graham. And he's the founder of Arrow Leadership where I served for, for 20 years. Uh, and he, he's an artist and he painted this and I asked him why, what captured you about this, this painting? And he said, this is Billy's backyard like Billy Graham's backyard, and I am a super fan. So Billy Graham's backyard's kind of a, even a big deal to me. And, and Leighton, who sat many afternoons in the backyard, was sitting there one day, and he saw this gate, and he needed to paint it, and I asked him why, and he said, Jesus is the gate. And he said, as I was sitting there, I was reminded that for the last 50 years, Billy and I have been pointing people to the gate of Jesus. That gate actually is a symbol, it's an icon of all that we've been doing is pointing people to Jesus. And I was like, that is so cool. So I went to John chapter 10, and here's what it says. Uh, I am the gate for the sheep, Jesus says. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. Pointing people to the gate. That's at the heartbeat of CBC. We want students to be pointed to the gate of Jesus, to have vibrant spiritual lives, godly character, to be deeply rooted in community, to be passionate about serving, and pointing other people to the gate of Jesus. The gate is a source of life. That's what we celebrated last Sunday. I want to just remind you, a stuff you already know, the next picture. This is what that cross is about. On this side, God is calling us from, and through the power and the work of the cross, God is moving us to. And you go back and forth, and it is pretty incredible. From rejection to acceptance, from isolation to community, from division to reconciliation, from fear to peace, from selfishness to service, from brokenness to healing, from lies to truth, from condemnation to blessing, from death to life, from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from strongholds to freedom, from sinfulness to holiness, from injustice to justice, from toil to purpose, from chaos to shalom, from hate to love, from defeat to victory. Can I get a South Abbotsford amen? Amen. Yeah. We're all on a journey. If you've said yes to Jesus, you're on a journey from and by the power of the Spirit too. And as you head on this journey, by God's grace, we're called to point people to the gate. Because the people around you, our neighbors, the people outside these walls are actually designed for this side. There's a longing built into them, even though they might not be able to put it in those words, to be on this side, to live in this new life, this abundant life that God calls us to through the gate of Jesus. Amen? I'm going to land the plane here with this one. Let me ask you this question. Last weekend, you celebrated the cross, the empty tomb, the best news ever. My question for you, if we were to uh, add up your prayers from last week, and your prayers from last week that were for people to walk through the gate, and imagine that all those people you prayed for last week to walk through the gate 
came through the gate this morning, how many people would come through the gate? What I'm asking is, after hearing the best news, the biggest news, the greatest news, did that impact your prayers this last week? How many people, if we prayed, would be saying yes to Jesus today? I don't guilt you with that question because when I answered, when I heard that question the first time, my answer was zero. Because I'm praying for safety and comfort and, and all the, the important things around me, but not so much for people that haven't walked through the gate yet. Who do you need to pray for to walk through the gate this year? Maybe it's you walking through the gate this year. Maybe it's praying for somebody, and I wonder if there are some people who you've given up praying for to walk through the gate. I want to encourage you to start praying again. I'll close with this story. For the last 20 years, I've lived here on the West Coast. My dad is back in Ontario, and he's on a journey with, with God, and I've been praying from here that that journey would come to a him saying yes to Jesus. And after 20 years, you kind of start getting some asterisks beside your prayers. I know I should pray, but, and then as he's gotten older, 85 now, I'm like, God, how are you gonna get into his world? So, I call up my dad, and he's had a rough month. Uh, This September, he had COVID all month. And he said to me, uh, I have no energy, and I've got all these uh, grapes in the backyard, and I can't go pick them or anything like that. So uh, I know you, Steve, you work a lot with the Salvation Army, so I actually called up the Salvation Army and asked them to come pick my grapes. Imagine being a pastor at the Salvation Army and getting that call. Would you come pick my grapes? (laughs) Wonderfully enough, they went and picked his grapes in the backyard. And they talked to him, and they spent time with him, and invited him to come to what they were doing. And it was this reminder to me, and may it be a reminder to you, that God's still about his business of drawing people to himself. There's more to be written in my dad's story, but I had no thought in my prayers that COVID, grapes, and the Salvation Army would be a faith step for my dad. So cool. And I called those Salvation Army officers at the other end of the country and I said, I don't know if you know it, but you were on a holy appointment in my dad's backyard. You didn't know that, picking those grapes, but you were on a holy appointment. All of you have holy appointments this week. There are people praying for people that you're gonna rub shoulders with. And through your life, through your words, through your serving, may you point them to the gate of Jesus. Would you stand with me? In a moment, there's gonna be an opportunity to respond. That might be singing. That might be being quiet where you are. That might mean coming forward to pray with somebody from the prayer team. When we're confronted with the awesomeness of Jesus, We've got to respond in some way. And for some of you, it might be that you resonate with that first picture of that woman down on her hands and feet reaching out for Jesus, desperate for Jesus. Maybe your response today in some way, whether it's prayer or where you are, singing a little bit louder is saying, I am desperate for you, Jesus. Or it's restoring me, reigniting me a desperation for you, Jesus. Maybe it's praise, thank you that you see me, that you understand me, that you care for me, and that you can help me. Maybe it's making that shift, that reset from doing stuff for Jesus to living today and this week with Jesus at the center with him. Maybe it's, I'm gonna go through that gate today. I'm gonna say yes to Jesus because I don't wanna live on this side of the cross I wanna live on this side of the cross and today could be that day for you. Maybe it's actually, I'm gonna double down on prayer. The people that I've said, I don't think this is ever gonna happen. 
It's that story about COVID and grapes and Steve's dad's given me some faith to say, I'm gonna pray today for that gate. I don't know how you wanna respond, but uh, you're invited to respond and however it's best, prayer team, where you're at, singing a bit louder, being a bit quieter. Excellent, thank you, Steve. Let's respond. Prayer team, if you can uh, come on up, please. Anybody, if you feel like you'd like some prayer, come on up uh, with the prayer team. Let's respond with this uh, with this song. Sing along with Isaac here. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing behold him. He who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him. You died with sinners and saints. The blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him. He who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our dead. Very death as he rose to life.
awesome. Please come on up if you need prayer still. One more song. Suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south And east to west We hear Christ be magnified And were the whole from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. They okay, sing it out here. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in us. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of our lives. Christ be magnified in us. When every creature finds its inmost melody, Every human heart its native cry. Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. I join you in your sufferings, and I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be
gate remains open. <laughs> um, if you still want prayer, the prayer team is going to be here. If you need to connect with each other, if you want to visit the booth or, or talk to Steve or look at his book, that's all out in the back. But this is what we leave when Steve shared about the gate. It's such a beautiful picture. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He's calling us by name. Listen to that voice. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace. You're dismissed.